All right, welcome back. Let's start to uh, dig in, I guess is the best way to view it on this chapter five. This is on viruses and viruses. Uh, well, I guess we all are more knowledgeable, not by choice about viruses, but uh, let's, let's dig in, find out some more interesting things about these uh, living organisms. Now, it may not fit the typical definition, we'll talk about that, but I assure you they're very much alive, and you'll see what my philosophy is on that. Way back uh, when uh, Louis Pasteur was looking at what causes sort of things to be contaminated and that sort of thing and he was working about uh, worried about things that were filterable because what he wanted to do was to get rid of these toxins and he referred to toxic or toxins as viruses which is a, uh, a Latin term and that kind of infers that so that's kind of where the origins of the word virus came from and it's interesting because you know we worry about when you go camping and you want to purify water things like that a 0.22 micron filter ought to do it uh, but what it doesn't do is filter some of the viruses and of course the uh, moose urine that was just upstream uh, that gets through but beyond that uh, the the point I wanted to make of course is that viruses are small and we refer to them as alive because well you know I can take out Clorox and kill it so if something can kill it, then it must have been alive at some point in time. But it's different. Granted, it, it is different. So viruses infect every type of cell. Bacteria, believe it or not, viruses are smaller than bacteria. And millions of them can attach onto the surface of bacteria. So that kind of gives you the size, which I'll, I'll go over here in a minute, uh, comparative sizing algae, fungi, protozoa, plants, animals, everything. So the next time you swallow or gulp a mouthful of ocean water, think about seawater contains about 100 million viruses per ml, a milliliter. That's a lot. So many years, the cause of viral infections was unknown. A good old Louis Pasteur postulated that living things were smaller than that bacteria and caused diseases. He also pr proposed the term virus is Latin for poison. The, the, the virus itself is, is sort of a term or a label that we put on these uh, types of living forms. Uh, Ivanovsky and Birnernick uh, showed that uh, uh, a disease in tobacco, the toba tobacco mosaic virus was, was this causative agent for this kind of a disease that we saw this blotting, splotting, uh, splotted type of nature of the leaves on tobacco. And Loeffler and Froch uh, discovered animal viruses call, cause foot and mouth disease in cattle, which was a very uh, debilitating disease. I can go over that. I had to write a report on that years ago when I was in school. And I thought it was a kind of a boring topic, but actually, to my surprise, it wasn't. It's quite interesting, but uh, I'll save you from that. Filterable virus. Early researchers found, of course, that when we had host organisms that pass through a sort of a, a porcelain filter, which the pore size is pretty big, uh, designed to trap bacteria, the filtrate, in other words, what got through that filter, was still infectious. Hmm. This proved that a cell-free, as far as we understood, fluid can contain agents that can cause an infection. And of course this was sort of the issue, but we've now come to know that it's, it's a virus. Viruses come in various different types of shapes. And not all of them are represented here. Uh, I've gotten to, to really uh, be interested in the shapes of viruses. I 3D print them and if there's a particular virus that you're willing to write a report on a particular virus of uh, some maybe something interesting uh, and and you would like a 3d printed version of it uh, what i would suggest is um, i will prepare a document as to how uh, i do my magic with the 3d printing and if you're interested in learning how to do that 
and want to write a report on that, uh, submit a proposal, and because of timing and all that, I'll select as many as I can, and once I print them, I will send that to you so you'll have a printed version of a virus that uh, may be of interest to you. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that at a later date, but uh, that's a proposal uh, I have been playing with, and I think now is the best time to see. I'll use you as my uh, test vehicle to see if something like that actually is, uh, has value. So let me know. Uh, just send me an email and uh, with your proposal. Uh, I may post the proposal format or just just state the virus, the type of virus, and why you're interested, and uh, we'll we'll take it from there. We'll see what we can do. Now, the various sizes and shapes. I have a few slides here on this. Look at the virus shapes and sizes. We have. Uh, where is a good representative? Hmm, E. coli. Uh, we're going to be working with E. coli, and most likely when you did your hand washing or looking at contaminants of hands and various things, uh, E. coli is probably it was a colony growing on it. It's usually a whitish little colony, depending on the media that we're using. But uh, there is E. coli bacterium as a, as a size. Now, the bacteriophage, T4, the even numbers, there's odd T1s, T3s, and that sort of thing. But T4, usually we talk about those in the nomenclature. That would infect E. coli. So you can see this virus way up here is 225 nanometers tall, fitting on the surface of this E. coli. This scrunches down and inserts its DNA into the E. coli and uh, so now E. coli instead of being a bacterium that's just trying to grow and be happy it now becomes a factory to make more bacteriophage so we'll talk more about that but it was that basic relationship in understanding bacteriophages that led to our understanding of other viruses that infect human cells and we'll talk more about that but look at all the different there's rabies I was bitten by a cat when I was uh, working for a veterinarian, and um, it came in as a suspect for rabies. So guess where I got my rabies vaccine to prep me for vet school was due to that. But it, it looks like a bullet. It's really strange. Uh, Ebola. Uh, what a nasty virus. I had a student do a project on Ebola. I printed it. it it's uh, pretty scary stuff. Here's a human red blood cell in comparison. That's just a, a corner piece. Uh, just a, It would just extend out, if you can imagine, in your mind way out. So you can see how small these are. Viroid is something that we're not really sure. It kind of looks like a virus. Oid just means it resembles a virus. So uh, we're down there. Tobacco mosaic. That's one of the early ones. The rhinovirus. It causes sort of the common cold. Adenovirus. Um, there's another bacteriophage. Uh, these are a little bit different um, types. Affect other microorganisms, uh, other types of, of bacteria. Uh, polio virus it causes polio. It's, it's pretty small. Uh, prion. That is uh, another sort of weird uh, entity in itself. It's a it's a protein that doesn't fold right, or we're not really sure, but that's sort of new 200 by 20 nanometers is pretty small uh, vaccinia virus um, so this is a good example of various um, uh, different types of microorganisms I have some other comparisons here so here's the tobacco mosaic the t7 virus uh, that's an odd so it doesn't do e coli papilloma virus Zika virus uh, Ebola virus. Look how look at these things. Aren't they just nasty? We're going to be looking at the human in, immunodeficiency or HIV virus uh, as an example, and an adenovirus uh, and Zika uh, virus as we move along, just so that we have a good sample. So these are probably good ones if you want to familiarize yourself with different types and classes of viruses. Um, th th this this is a good list, a good short list. There's a lot more than this, I assure you. I'm sorry to say. So we have uh, a schematic of various different types of uh, viruses we're gonna we're gonna look at. It doesn't really matter. This is kind of detailed and uh, 
in order to understand the x-ray the reason um, I wanted to, to show you this this is actually a publication so if you get my uh, PowerPoint slide set and click on that image it will take you or download a paper from PNAS uh, which is a journal and it's a journal article that describes uh, how this particular virus is, is sort of constructed and I, I like to have it serve as sort of a uh, sort of a proof or uh, uh, an example of how these viruses are, are built. And this is really, really important understanding these viruses. These are not living entities as per se once they're constructed. It's sort of like an aircraft. Uh, all the, in, uh, the intimate detail and all the design had to be engineered. It's put together and then it doesn't change after that until it has to go through the reconstruction which we'll talk about so once the virus is built it's that's it that's sort of like an aircraft where it uh, does whatever it was intended to do when it was built and so there's certain characteristics though of redundancy in other words there's repetitiveness in the structure a lot of times it has to do with a capsid this is the enclosement uh, or feature that protects the genome of some kind. Now viruses are DNA or RNA, never both. So uh, if, if you can remember that, then that means that there's a way we can classify viruses. Is it a DNA virus or is it a RNA virus? But they're never both. And that way we can bin it, at least it's our feeble attempt to try to understand and, and classify these. So the basic proteins of course, they're, these represent the the, uh, the forms that we talked about in, in terms of the, the primary structures of, uh, of proteins. And we have the sort of the uh, ribbon form and then the straights, sort of uh, linear forms and things. And they fold in a certain way. And then they interact with charge and shape. And then they associate as a protein structure together. So this is... Uh, a quaternary structure of three different proteins that fit together. Now when I say different, they're colorized, they're subunit proteins. They're actually the same protein, but they interact in an exclusive way so that they form this sort of triangle piece. And then that triangle piece is now uh, fitted with other ones that are fitted just like this. So if, if you were to have a really cool design, i.e. Uh, a simple design and let's say I just make the one protein well, that protein now assembles self assembles into this triangle which then the triangle self assembles together to form this virus structure but that that's pretty scary stuff uh, it's creepy actually to think about that I'll come back to that if you didn't get that right away so there is a link hidden in this and uh, if you click on that in, in my uh, graphic, uh, you'll see the, uh, or get, download the paper if you want to read that. Now it's very technical, but it does go over the history of how these things form, which is fascinating to me. So here's another diagram uh, showing the capsid. This is what encapsulates, if you want to think of how to remember the, cap, the capsule, or uh, the capsid, uh, is a covering of these protein structures. If you look, in every case, they're made up of subunits that interact together. Look how this same protein comes in an assembly and then it's repetitive. Now HIV capsid does this. It's fascinating. Uh, it's scary. Uh, so it, it, its genome, when it uh, inserts, and you have to build it because we're going to talk about that, the piracy, the viruses of pirates, and they hijacked your genome uh, machinery to make the proteins and all that. Well, it has a pretty simple repertoire of things that it builds, and then they self-assemble, and then they make these horrid things. Uh, it's not unique to HIV. We also have the tobacco mosaic virus is composed of these subunits here that associate in a circular helical type fashion around uh, the uh, RNA. 
And then um, other examples, but you can see in some cases there are two different types of viral proteins that come together to make this subunit that have different size and shape and different genetic uh, background, but all of which is virus uh, de uh, de determined, pre-engineered, now however you want to think about that, I'll leave that to you, uh, but a viral protein 1 and viral protein 2 come uniquely together such that it fits together perfectly with other viral ones and twos to make the triangle like shape and that's repetitive uh, so you see that that you see a trend viruses are repetitive they're composed of these closely fitting subunits that were engineered to self-assemble and create this unique form of life and uh, we call it a virus scary stuff so I want you to explore that yourself I've included into the slide set a link uh, I just put the pointer on top there you can uh, if you uh, for some reason can't access my slide set whatever uh, there's the link you can just type the uh, inf information but it goes to the PDB website which is a protein data bank and I use a lot of that uh, to get the sources of my uh, 3d printing materials that uh, are accurate these are uh, x-ray crystallography in other words there's a technique that uses x-rays that uh, accurately de depicts what in this case a virus looks like and so that you can see um, uh, these viruses and hold on to them and things with 3d printing so they're accurate they're not models that you know just random they are accurate so there's a little description here of what the dengue virus is it's it's a huge uh, human issue and we uh, have been seeing more and more of it if you notice the PDB structure 1k 4r all of the PDBs have four letter number designations you can type that in at the browser just that designation it'll find it and then you can download the structure and I have a recipe on how to do all that but um, to make a model but for now you can go uh, to BDB or you can click on this and it'll take you and what I'd like you to do is that you can print out this is a paper model it tells you how to fold it and what I wanted to, to do is to, to prove to you the redundancy and the precision that these viruses have and how all these things fit together so if you can put that together fold it and then take a picture of it send it to me I'll give you credit uh, for doing that and it's a hands-on type of demonstration I think uh, you won't be uh, upset now the what's nice is it's not the only viruses that are represented this way if you want to do a different virus that is on PDB I'm not going to say what they are I want you to explore PDB so if you don't want to do the dengue virus there's other ones you can do those and then take a picture and send that to me and I'll give you credit but just one per customer because well um, I gotta leave enough credit uh, for the other important things of course and uh, but it's a, it's an interesting thing and I hope uh, you look at that so you can just click on there you can see there's the the link designation uh, for getting to that particular model but uh, you can explore that on PDB yourself there so you can um, look at the various um, different forms of these viruses when all it's all said and done uh, the, the viruses have unique structures on the outside as well and that is something I want to discuss just briefly here is this is where the rubber meets the road this is where the part of the ugliness comes from the very first thing viruses have to do now it can't change once this when these are made is it might as well just pour it in cement because they're not changing and the chemical shape and structure out here really determines uh, if it's going to stick to you or not it's some particular tissue someplace like respiratory tract or the genital urinary genital tract or where, whatever these are sort of the uh, lock and key the re very specific what I call tissue trophism in other words these only recognize a certain cell and a cell charge and shape and it adheres and once it does it gains entry well you're under the uh, 
the influences. Now, I randomly chose coronavirus before the outbreak and all that. This was just in my slide set. So any of, of you that vomited while I was bringing up the slide and you saw coronavirus, uh, i.e. Uh, that you're tired of seeing it or hearing about it, that's okay. Uh, let's learn about it so that you're, um, you can dispel um, notions and so you can uh, see that the truth and the lies that might be out there about it and uh, knowledge is always important there's the herpes virus uh, herpes is uh, one of those that it's a gift that keeps on giving uh, we'll talk a little bit about it the bird flu virus uh, we'll talk about uh, and some of these the coronaviruses might be considered uh, uh, also from the birds uh, or uh, bats and various things we'll talk about that smallpox caused a huge problem at one point in time still well we've eliminated it with vaccination so there's a good thing influenza virus every year we get a vaccination for that usually miss it and get it wrong but uh, influenza virus is still uh, the same sort of thing it, it causes these uh, diseases but these are respiratory this is respiratory and so anyhow we'll talk more about that so if we look at the actual structures that I show you, these representations, uh, they are representations or drawings by an artist. And so that helps uh, break down some of the mystery. But you can see under electron microscopy, these structures are real. I just wanted to conf conf uh, confirm that when you see these things, there is an element, a large element of truth uh, behind it and it's important that you see that. So are they organisms? Are they alive? Are they dead? You hear that all the time. And it's, to me, it's an annoying concept because it may not fit the classic definition of living. In other words, they don't reproduce on their own, but they, they have the programming, i.e. the genetic material. Once it gains entry into your cell, it takes it over and, and that's how it accomplishes the uh, reproducibility. So outside of that, yes, they're alive. Uh, they uh, very much so. If, if that lock and key or that receptor opens the door, whatever tissue it is on its host, then um, yeah, they're, they're active and they're pathogens and they're nasty. Um, and so they have distinctive biological characteristics. I've already mentioned one, the, the, the pirate aspect of this. A particle so small, simple, and seemingly insignificant cause disease. Well, I'll give you the best uh, answer for that. It's because they're simple, small, and seemingly insignificant. <laughs> I don't mean to be funny, but sometimes the the best designs are the simple designs. My dad was a mathematician and he knew that some of his math solutions had to be right because they boiled down to just simplistic uh, sort of an association, sort of like Einstein's E equals MC squared. Uh, it represents some aspect of hidden aspects of the universe and we have to get our hands on it or wrap our brains around it and we use math to do that and once you've quantified everything it comes down to simplistic uh, numbers even though it was quite complicated to get there so I just kind of just described a virus to you I believe uh, using math as an analogy uh, so what is the connection between viruses and cancer well anything that's simple and seemingly insignificant that utilizes the genetic system to make copies of itself. Anytime we interact with our genome, uh, anything that interacts, even our own replication or UV light from suntans that uh, either the uh, using uh, a suntan, uh, you're paying for it in a, a booth or out in the sun uh, bathing in, in the, uh, the nice beach areas or things like that. Those can modify DNA. Anytime uh, anything manipulates DNA, you run the risk of damaging it, and i.e. cancer. So two sides of the debate. And the debate really is just about are they alive or not. You can see that I'm not really impressed with that debate. But 
because they are alive. I mean, if I could take something and chemically modify it, like with Clorox, and kill it, then it was alive, right? It's infectious. That's what we re refer to as alive. Since viruses are unable to replicate, see, that's the uh, key, independently from the host cell, they're not living things. Well, by what? whose definition? It's just our definition of everything else that we've seen, which is valid, but... Uh, so the life, so you can see where I'm going with that. Even though viruses don't exhibit most of the life processes, they can direct them. Thus, that uh, it takes away that uh, the lack of their ability to replicate because, well, they are, uh, just not directly. Viruses are better described as active or inactive rather than alive or dead. Well, it, it's semantics. Um, alive or dead, well, I mean, you know, is is a cockroach alive or dead? It's just a bag of enzymes that moves around and scurries and things. Bacteria, same sort of thing. So, anyhow, it comes down to semantics of what you want to call it. Uh, I'm going to leave that to you, uh, what your opinions are on that. I like to look at it as the viruses are like little spaceships. What is being uh, deployed in this space starship or whatever is DNA or RNA and that's the genetic material that once it gets inside a cell or a host or whatever it's doing now takes over the 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 ship I guess you could say and to make more of these spaceships so they're really very effective they've been around uh, for a long long time uh, very beginning of life I guess I wasn't there uh, but you can see the basic designs with the spikes and all those things. It's sort of like, like I was making reference to with the aircraft. It's really just a mechanism of, of um, making the genetic material uh, mobile so that it can move around and go to places. Sort of like a spaceship. So the vital role of viruses in evolution. Uh, they have been modifying our genetic makeup. I'll guarantee to you right now that in your genome and in your each of your hundred trillion cells in your body that you have remnants of viruses dating back since the very beginning of, of humankind uh, these have been around with us and so 10% of our genome comes from viruses and 10 to 20% of bacteria DNA comes from virus sequences uh, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. In other words, they have to, in order to replicate, they have to go into your cells and take it over. And the best analogy, of course, that is of, of a pirate. The viruses are pirates. What, what they do is that they are unwelcomed. It doesn't matter. They gain entry by force. Well, in this case, by the very specific tissue trophism. In other words, that's host specific that binds to a particular receptor on a cell. It's like pushing, or as they say in North Carolina, mashing the button to call the elevator. Uh, when you push on that, it opens the door, and then um, you either go up or down in the building as an elevator, but allows you to gain entry of the virus, and now you can do your pirate thing. And the pirate thing means that it takes over the control of the genome and it says, no, I don't want you building any of your stuff. You're going to build mine. And at the end of the day, the reward for you doing this is you either become a manufacturing facility for that virus or uh, the cell explodes. So either way, it's not fun. And uh, unfortunately, we've all had this go. If you've ever had a cold, a flu or something like that, uh, it's an attack. You, you were invaded. Uh, your privacy was invaded. Uh, you, you actually, your DNA was uh, uh, corrupted uh, with this, uh, these viruses. And so the tissue trophism, this is not by accident. So where does the specificity come from? It comes from you. In other words, once the virus initially has to gain that entry, in other words, it can mash that elevator button, then once it gains entry, it integrates into your, your, your DNA, or uh, the RNA gets converted into DNA. However, we look at, we'll, we'll get into some more details of that. But once it gets in, it does the pirating, 
and it makes more of itself. But if you notice, on the way out, it takes parts of you with it. And it doesn't do that by accident. That is the uh, lock and key part, that receptor. It knows exactly what it's doing. It's by design. And so this little spaceship now wants to come back to you. It now has the keys to do it. And so you can see, and this is just a sort of a simplistic view, believe it or not, of, of the process. But HIV is a uh, RNA virus. It takes uh, an enzyme it actually brings with it called reverse transcriptase, which does exactly what it's saying. It takes RNA and makes DNA, which is against the central dogma theory of DNA to RNA to a protein. Uh, but that's okay because it's a special case uh, of enzyme that does that. And it's not okay as far as uh, HIV is concerned. I mean, it's a disease process, but it's what this virus does. So it brings that to the party. So the virus, the, uh, the pirating goes on. It brings its own specialized weapon now to incorporate into your uh, chromosome and to make more of the virus protein. And then, uh, so when, you don't have AIDS, by the way. I just want to make that point. You get infected with a virus. You don't have AIDS. What you have is an HIV infection. And you get a viral load. And this is where the viral load comes from, is that now your cells become production facilities. And so the initial assault was to get into your cell to make more of them. And once it makes more of them, this, now, hold on. Are you sitting down? I hope you're sitting down because once they gain entry and they make their little factories and you start to get virus loads of these things, it waits until a random mutation occurs. And when a mutation occurs that now dictates that it can a attack a certain type of immune cell, a helper cell, a communication cell, which we'll talk about in chapters 13, 14, uh, once it, uh, it uh, modifies or takes them out, uh, we, we essentially have no, no longer an immune system that this virus is disabled because of a random mutation. Now, you think about that. This virus knows or has, or however you want to put it in a theological sense, it has the potential of, of killing the host by causing its immune system to fail. Now, that's pretty ugly. Uh, that uh, it really comes to a design. It, it just it's like somebody said, well, let's see how we can kill somebody. Let's design that. You see what I'm saying? It, it's pretty ugly. Anyhow, that's just my own assertion. So here's the properties of viruses. I will get intracellular. They're pirates. 10 to the 31st, that's uh, one with 31 zeros. That's a bunch on the earth. Are ubiquitous. In other words, they're everywhere. Just remember, ubiquitous is just a fancy Latin term, which means it's everywhere in nature and has a major impact of biological life. Ultra microscopic, in other words, it's pretty small. It's in the nano scale, which we are living in the nano uh, age right now. Um, are not cells, but they're compact little spaceships. Now, I added the spaceship part. Um, they don't fulfill our view of the characteristics of life, i.e. they reproduce on their own, but that's okay. They figure out a way to do it. The basic structure consists of a protein shell, a capsid, surrounded by a nucleic acid core. Uh, nucleic acids can be DNA or RNA, but not both. Highlight that, circle it, don't forget that. It's a DNA virus or an RNA virus, never both. Nucleic acids can be double-stranded, single-stranded, single-stranded RNA, or even double-stranded RNA. So, you know, typically we, we think of RNA as just being single-stranded. Well, not really. Like transfer RNAs, there's a certain amount of folding in regions where it's double-stranded uh, RNA. Molecules on the virus surface impart high specificity. And where did those molecules on the surface come from? You. Uh, if that's the, uh, the target, uh, which imparts the high specificity for attachment, of course. It's taking part of you to attach to. I mean, it's, really? Multiplying by taking control of the host's genetic material and regulating the synthesis and assembly of new viruses. Lacking or lax enzymes for most metabolic processes. Hmm. That's okay. It doesn't need. It's 
these even leaner than meaner than and than bacteria uh, little fighting machines it's it comes down to just genetic material it's infectious RNA or DNA it's really what it is uh, so it lacks the machinery for synthesizing of course so that's pretty much uh, for the first go round we'll stop on this uh, notion uh, which best describes viruses we have heterotrophic well <laughs> sap saprobic obligate intracellular parasites, chemoautotrophic, photosynthetic. Well, uh, a lot of that is meant uh, not really to trick you, but to think about the terms because we've, we've already talked about those sorts of things. But the answer is obligate intracellular parasites. And so that's the nature of these viruses and it does it with redundancy and it does it with specificity and it's scary stuff. Uh, so I'm going to stop here, but next time we're going to talk about how they're classified and how viruses are named, and uh, we'll discuss the viruses. And so next time we'll pick up right here in section 5.2, same channel, same bat cave, and all that stuff. And uh, stay well.